This is not a glamour shot. I don't know why it's being used. <laughs> but uh, I am from South Dakota, which I think was home of the glamour shot. We really loved it there. Um, and uh, yeah, I have no idea how this picture got here, but I, I do, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my name is Stacy Bear. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we, as the Sierra Club, me as an individual and as a veteran of the United States military, kind of got to this process and got to work with AWE and where I think we can go about this process. I'm also, by the way, very insecure at this point about my bona fides for speaking at this conference. I'm not, I'm not a PhD, I'm not a musician. Um, really, most of what my life has been about has been breaking down doors and blowing things up. Um, but so, yeah, all right, there's like one person with me. <laughs> so, thanks. Um, but anyway, so this is me. Um, this is my background. Um, this is the face shot I like to use. So I have some military experience. I went to school in the South. I went to an AME church. I haven't felt like I was back in AME church. Again, back to that, so that brought me back to this really uh, awe-inspiring experience. Um, if you haven't been to an AME church, find one, go to it, uh, know that you won't get anything else done that Sunday. Um, so it takes, the services are long, but they're wonderful. Um, so yeah, my background, um, I, I was in the military for a long time. Uh, that's all I ever thought that I wanted to do. Um, I got my commission out of the University of Mississippi in 2000. It was a very different type of of awe, right? And I think one of the interesting things we haven't really talked about is that awe can actually be from a negative experience, right? You can feel very, very small in a very, very different way. Um, and, and I remember speaking with a sheikh when I was in Baghdad and I was getting ready to leave Iraq and they knew I was leaving before I did. Um, and he said to me, we had heard from the evil people that when the American soldiers came in that American soldiers ate babies for breakfast and we didn't believe that until we met you. <laughs> so I know that they had been in awe, right, of, of me and, and the military might that we had seen, and I had also been in awe of what I had seen in terms of exploding vehicles um, and, and what it takes to dismember a body in a very minimal amount of time. And I think one of the things that, from that experience of awe, was how little energy can be used to create an incredibly negative experience and I think one of the challenges we have in this community is the amount of energy we have to put in to create a positive awe experience. So in between my experience, thanks. In, betwi in between my experiences of the military, so from 2000 to 2004, I was in the army. I couldn't actually deploy to Iraq or Afghanistan at the time. That was, that was a negative for me. Um, and so I went and I um, did landmine clearance and explosive ordnance disposal work. And one of the things that um, both in Iraq and Angola that was really cool was that uh, when I look back on those experiences, what subsumed the negative experiences was the fact that I got to experience really beautiful cultures, really beautiful landscapes, and really beautiful people. And so now I'm kind of on this project to go back to all the places that I either cleaned up after war or, or, or didn't clean up necessarily um, after war or, um, or fought war and go back uh, through the lens of adventure and through the lens of awe. And the goal is, right, to tell a story about these places that we can share here in the United States and around the world that people are people and that uh, there's a universality of experience and that if we can focus on things like adventure and awe, then maybe we can get to a little bit of world peace. And so in my head, I've kind of conceived of this project that I want to take a composer with me to these places, regardless if they can ski or not, so that they can experience it with us and that in the telling of the story, we can have this multi-sensational experience, right? So that it's not just seeing a movie or anything else like that, but it would be fully immersed. So I, I don't know what you're doing in the winter, if you'd be interested in coming to <laughs> Afghanistan or Iraq with us as we go skiing, but we'd love to have you. Yeah, so, because um, I've been thinking about who the right musician ought to be, and I have, and I have a lot of musician friends, and they're all like, no, man. And these are all guys, so I, I'm, in, I'm in recovery. And you should see the things we used to do together. And they're like, nope, not going skiing in Afghanistan. I'm like, really? This is kind of the, on the lower end of things we've done together. <laughs> but then as I heard you today, I was like, you're the one. So. <laughs> anyway, 
So when I get back from Iraq, I realize that um, I need to get out in nature. And I have this kind of base understanding that this is what I need to do. So I go down to South Africa. This is moments before, by the way, I snap that surfboard in two. Um, so nature totally kicks my ass when I get home. And I think that that's enough for me to go, to go on with life. And I go on to graduate school, and um, I, I have no intention of being a veteran. I have no intention of having a career in the outdoors. But the problem is, is it didn't work out. Right? So I have this huge drug addiction. Um, Citibank gave me student loans for graduate school. Most of my student loans are still going off to pay off drug debt. For a while, I thought I was going to get an economic award from a small village in Bolivia, but that never came. <laughs> and what ended up happening in this process is that, uh, yeah, side note, this is a challenge, right? So I have a kid now, and I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to talk to her about drugs, because they were really fun for a long time until they weren't, and then it was really bad. And, um, and so I was really suicidal, and I had a lot of issues. I had a lot of mental health issues, a lot of issues that I was unwilling to uh, you know, acknowledge. And what that really boiled down to was trauma, and, and, uh, and, uh, and the reality that I didn't have a framework for my experience when I came back to the United States. I didn't have a community for that, um, and there was no surf spot near Philadelphia, where I lived. And then I ended up in, in Colorado, and there was, there was no surf spot there. So it was a lot of depression, and, it, um, and that became suicidal ideation, and um, what in the veteran community we refer to as 9mm or 45 caliber mouthwash. And that's what seemed like it was the reality, right? And, so, and that's where I wanted to go. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to find myself. But what ended up happening is I got out rock climbing, which is not easy for a guy like me, right? I mean, we talk a lot about heavy gravity days, and when I rock climb, there's always a heavy gravity day. But um, <laughs> rock climbing... Um, really did change my life, and it, and it, and it saved my life. Um, and I climbed up out of depression. Uh, this is a trip, um, this is the first trip we did with Adventure Not War. Uh, this is uh, Alex Honnold, um, who you may have heard of. He's, he's a well-known rock climber. He's a really good friend. This is me laughing when he said, I thought you were a good climber. <laughs> um, and this is us in Angola as part of that Adventure Not War experience. But when I started climbing, I really did it to heal myself, and I didn't know that, right? Like, I just, I mean, the, the phone call with a buddy of mine named Chuck Berman was, I was like, well, what should I do? And he was like, look, man, I'm, I'm tired of hearing about how depressed you are. So just kill yourself, rejoin the army, or do something about it. And the do something about it ended up being uh, rock climbing. By the way, that is not recommended <laughs> at all when you're talking to people. But... Um, I, I'm an outlier, and it works. <laughs> um, again, kicking down doors, <laughs> blowing stuff up, um, a lot of head injury, a lot of head trauma. So, but I got out rock climbing, and it was first for the community of veterans, um, and, and that was the community I ended up identifying with. But what I realized really quickly was around camaraderie and the groups and the people that I could meet and all these different things. And I, and I started realizing, and this is a mixed group of veterans and non-veterans, what I started realizing was that, that I could replicate the positive experiences of war. And there are a lot of positive experiences in war, actually. And I could replicate those good things in a broader community. And I began to realize through this experience that uh, it wasn't just me, but it was also kids who had experienced this. And I think um, when, when we heard from, and I want to become a teacher now out in Queens, um, <laughs> about, about trauma, um, that it's not just veterans, right? And I think that's one of the things that as a veteran community we oftentimes struggle with. So there are all these other people who are beginning to <coughs> deal with that. But what we realized was we needed more evidence and we needed more research. And um, we're just like, we're just going through stuff at this point. So, um, so with the evidence, we started looking at the evidence, even though, you know, there's a lot of spiritual evidence, right? I mean, all the big religions talk about wilderness. Uh, um, I live in Utah. Joseph Smith found the golden plates in a forest. Jesus Christ, right, goes out 40 days in the wilderness. Mohammed meditates in caves. But that didn't matter. So we started doing research. But the research wasn't enough. This first research with Michigan wasn't enough. So we reached out and we met um, Dacker Keltner. And Dacker and I bonded over this guy, which you saw a picture earlier of, of Iggy Pop. Uh, music has also played a really critical role. So from there, we started this relationship with the Greater Good Science Center. You've heard a lot about what that looks like. And um, I've got five minutes. I spent too much time talking about you. So, um, <laughs> which is fine. 
<laughs> plane ride to Afghanistan is going to be long. We'll have more time to catch up then. <laughs> so we started doing the research. Uh, and what we learned through the research um, around public health, right, and I think what we're going to get to to a point with this research and what we're driving at is that it's not too long from now that in a couple of years you're going to be prescribed off for specific conditions. And it's going to go beyond park prescriptions, right, which are, are you physically fit? But they're going to say, oh, you haven't, you know, you, you've got this trauma, we're going to give you this park prescription, and you're going to get a copay to go rafting commercially on the American River, right? And you're going to get a copay to buy hiking boots or to get a transit pass to get out to those parks. That day is coming. And that research is happening here. And that's, that's where we're going with this. So what that means then is <laughs> this, this is my little girl. So anyway, so the world that I want to create for my little girl, um, and today is like the first day in a long time. I almost wanted to do sit it down there because this is a couch that doesn't smell like uh, sour milk or, or baby poo, uh, which is generally how I smell right now. Um, but what I want to work is that this world, when she grows up, she's going to assume that this is our national health care system. And she's, she's not going to know of the challenges that we had. When she's five or six or seven years old and she thinks about going to a clinic, it might be Yosemite National Park, right? Because this is our national health care system. One of the things we have to work on in closing, though, is to make sure that we don't create the same disparities in access to healthcare and access to national parks that we already have in access to healthcare. And what that means is that we have to make a deliberate engagement to create equity and inclusivity in the national parks because there is a problem, and I want to highlight this just really briefly. I don't want to end on a negative note, but folks like John Muir and Teddy Roosevelt, for as much good as they did in this world, also created a conservation movement rooted in racism. <laughs> And that absolutely has to change. And one of the reasons that I've been able to see this is because as a veteran in the environmental and outdoor community right now, I'm seen as an outlier. Never mind that David Brower was a World War II veteran. Never mind that our first national park rangers were the Buffalo Soldiers, who clearly are also veterans, also you know, um, African-American background. So I came at it from a non-normative experience. And what that meant is, is that the people that I met in the outdoor world who happened to be black or women took me in as one of their own, despite the fact that I was a bearded white guy in plaid, because I came at it from a different experience. And we have to make it so that anybody who's new to the outdoors, who's new to this experience of awe, feels welcome and ultimately feels like they don't need some other genius to get them out there, but that they can do it on their own. So that not only this is our healthcare system, but that the schoolyard in, in Long Island City is also part of the healthcare system. And I'll close with this. Oh, there she is again. <laughs> ah, there she is, right? I'm actually not going to close with that. I will say she digs Iggy Pop. Um, she's totally into it. And she also really digs um, big heavy metal music, which my wife loves. Just kidding. She hates it. But my baby loves it. So this is a little wilder, and we want to create a world that she can actually explore, enjoy, and protect. And one of the things that I'll close with is this. We absolutely have to believe in good. We are going to win this. All right? So believe in good as we go through this process, because if we stop believing in good, and it's going to be really easy to get beat down too much, but, but you can't. You got to keep going outside. You got to keep looking at that dandelion fighting through the cracks in the sidewalk and believe that there is a world where awe is going to overwhelm in a positive way. Yeah.